All right, guys, uh, welcome. Trademarks 101. Uh, with the, we are at EPGD Law. I'm the founder, Eric Grotebois. I have with me the presenter, the main presenter, Benjamin Bedrava. We're going to record this and also make it available online, probably put it on our YouTube channel. And so if you're not already, follow us on YouTube. Um, and and I'll, I'll just take a, a step back. Trademarks is probably one of my favorite areas of law. It's this weird intersection between intellectual property, business, marketing, creativity, um, and some very uh, specific laws. So most of this presentation is trademarks, and then Ben is going to go into trade dress and a little bit of copyrights at the end. Um, so again, we are at EPGD Law in Coral Gables, Florida. Uh, the firm is about 10 years old. Benjamin Bedrava has been with the firm two years now, and he is an intellectual property specialist. Um, and Ben, uh, if you want to give a brief introduction for yourself. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Benjamin Bedrava. I started off most of my practice at a intellectual property firm doing just that, managing a trademark portfolio, reviewing and revising patent applications, doing copyrights, getting into far more trademark litigation than you'd think. Um, and coming here to EPGD, I've, I've brought a lot of that over and I, I'm glad to be able to share some of the things that I've learned over the last nine years with you guys, um, and hopefully you guys can take something away from this as well. So why don't we go ahead and jump into some of the basics. So to get started, you know, what is intellectual property generally? Intellectual property refers to those creations of the mind. The things that that you make, the inventions, literary and artistic works, names, symbols, images, all of these things that you may use or benefit from that aren't necessarily tangibles. The three primary types of intellectual property that people will talk about are going to be trademarks, copyrights, and patents. So trademarks generally were protecting anything that identifies your business or the source of goods or services. So that could be anything from logos, names, slogans, or icons. Copyrights, on the other hand, typically protect artistic works. So think literary works, books, musical works. So it could be uh, audio works, compose compositions, uh, dramatic works or graphic designs. Patents are the last kind of, and they typically will protect types of inventions. So those are designed to prevent someone from making, using, or selling different types of products or processes that you might create. Uh, ben, I have a question. So what is a, what is a patent lawyer? If you want to go back one slide, just elaborate a little bit more. So a patent lawyer is a attorney who has gone and taken the patent bar. So unlike, say, the Florida bar or the New York bar, where that allows you to practice in a specific state, the patent bar allows you to practice in front of the patent office. So in that context, typically what you're talking about is the ability to have an account to file patent applications to respond on patent applications, to file certain types of actions that are going to be directly before the, say, patent trial and appeal board. Um, whereas trademarks and copyrights, there isn't this additional bar of entry. Patent attorneys have to have, say, a technical uh, science background in order to be eligible. So if you're talking with somebody who is specifically a patent attorney, then that means they got some sort of a hard science degree, they pass this additional bar, and they have those extra privileges to be able to do that kind of work. So a non-patent lawyer can do patent litigation, but they can't do patent registration. Exactly. There's certain types of patent litigation, like things at the patent office directly. But if, say, you're in federal court where most patent litigation happens, any attorney can do that. Uh, they just wouldn't be able to, say, file that application with the patent office. 
So let's take a look at trademarks for starters. So trademarks are designed to protect your branding, your reputation, that goodwill that you develop with your customers. When you're talking about a trademark, we're talking about the things that customers get to know you by, how they search you, how they talk about you to their friends, where all of that memory goes when they think about who they just worked with, whose product they purchased. All of those things tie back to those elements that you hold yourself out to consumers as being uniquely you. So things that can be trademarked that we touched on a little bit earlier, brand names. So the name of your brand, the name of your business, your logos that could incorporate stylized designs on their own or may also incorporate some wording slogans so it could be anything from the uh slogan that tells somebody you know what type of products they're going to be getting into gives you some sort of feeling or or understanding of what this business is going to do that is conveyed in a unique way or it could be product and service names Take, for example, uh, large brands like Walmart. They're going to have a number of different products that they've created and they sell under their own house brand. And some of those products are going to have unique names. Think different names of cereals that they may offer. And each one of those product names, not just the overarching brand, can be trademarked as well. I got to ask the question, can every brand be trademarked? Not every brand is going to be able to get a trademark registration. So many types of brands that you're going to come across are going to be these unique, distinctive names. However, sometimes someone will set up a company and they will use a very generic or common name to uh, identify their brand. And unfortunately, in some instances, if your name is entirely descriptive, it just tells consumers what the product is or what those services you provide are. Think, for example, if my brand was The Lawyer, I wouldn't be able to get a trademark on The Lawyer because I can't stop other people from saying and conveying to consumers that they are, in fact, a lawyer. So, What about I when I add some words like Coral Gables Computer Repair? So in those cases, what you can end up having is a unique overall composition, but you're still going to run into descriptive issues in that case. So for example, Coral Gables describes the geographic area where your business is located. Computer repair tells the consumers what that service you provide is. So in those cases, the wording on its own probably can't be trademarked. However, if you want to get some protections, you may be able to trademark other elements, say the logo that accompanies that wording, where we have unique additional elements from the design that we can point to where consumers would be able to identify not just what we offer, but something that is uniquely us. So when we're talking about trademarks, we're talking about these marks that are used in connection with specific types of goods or services. So the Nice Agreement set out 45 different classes of goods and services where all things, everything that you can provide to a consumer under the sun will fall under. The first 34 classes all identify different types of goods. So everything from, let's say, purses and leather goods in class 18, clothing under class 25, jewelry under class 14. All of these things will fall under one or another class. Now, classes 35 to 45 will cover services. So class 45, legal services. We may have class 35 for advertising or retail services. The difference between a mark that is used to identify goods themselves and a mark that is used to identify a retail store that may sell certain types of goods. Often that's going to be where you're selling not just your own products, 
but the products of others. You know, I have thought a lot about this. And by the way, for anyone watching, um, it's easy to Google. Just Google the Nice Agreement, N-I-C-E, like Nice, the city in the south of France. So the Nice Agreement, a bunch of really smart people got their heads together and they uniformly made it because what it was is before every country made their own list. So the U.S. had a list, France had a list, Canada had a list. And so most of the industrialized companies, uh, countries got together and they said, hey, let's make one list so that in France, category 35 means the same thing as category 35 in the United States. Um, and then take it a step further, they've somehow organized all things that can be sold into 45 categories, which is amazing. Like I just wrapped my head around that. Obviously there's some broad categories and then there's some narrow categories. Like there's a category for firearms and then there's a category for scientific equipment that could be anything, right? Right. I mean, we have absolutely everything that you can provide under those 45 classes. Now, there are a couple of exceptions that fall under some strange uh, additional indicators that we have, say, a uh, collective organization where there isn't necessarily an owner. We're not necessarily providing the same level of a service or goods, um, but we have like a club where there's group membership. Uh, those will fall just outside of these. Those are going to be a lot more uncommon. Now, your classifications are one of the biggest steps for actually picking and registering your trademark. So the first thing that you want to do, once you've understood what the goods and services you want to offer are, is to do a trademark search. So you want to go out there and look, is there someone who is already using not just this exact mark, but a confusingly similar mark, something with could be slight variations that consumers aren't going to remember or think of. Remember, consumers are always going to have a general rather than specific impression of your or any mark. So when you're thinking about, is this mark too close? The best test I tell people is to say, you see a billboard in the beginning of the week for your product or your services, and then you see a billboard for this competitor's goods and services, say on Friday on your way home. Is that mark, are those goods and services close enough that you might think to yourself, you saw signs or advertisements for the same company? If so, then it probably is gonna be too close that there might be a conflict. Once you've decided, say, on what that mark is, you don't see anything similar out there, we want to select the appropriate classes that you're going to file under, because every class that you designate, there's going to be additional steps. We're going to have added filing fees for each class, and we're going to have to eventually be able to show we're using the mark in connection with each class. You could file an application claiming all 45 classes, but it's never going to get approved if you can't show you're using that mark in connection with all 45 classes and you've got a big budget to pay for the filing fees and the upkeep. Once you've got all that settled, you'll prepare, file your application with your particular information. And oftentimes this is where a attorney or an expert can come in and help guide you because the application can seem straightforward at first, but there are a lot of pitfalls that you can uh, end up creating more headaches, more problems for yourself later on if it's not done right the first time. After you've registered that trademark, it's gone through the whole process, the work doesn't stop there. You'll have to continue to maintain that trademark. So at the fifth year and then at every 10th year after registration, you'll have certain maintenance filings that need to be done. But then you also need to monitor the use of the mark and enforce that trademark to make sure it stays protected. If you register a trademark and then you go five, 10 years letting competitors run rampant using confusingly similar marks, you're gonna let your own rights be diluted and then it's gonna be much more difficult, if not impossible, for you to enforce that later on. Now, the trademark application process has become a longer and longer process than ever over the last four or five years with the advent of the Amazon brand registry requiring now 
at least a pending application in order to apply and join. Um, we have a number of different companies that have in mass filed applications in order to secure their rights to brands for online storefronts. Then, of course, we had COVID, which pushed everyone to a much more uh, online shopping and retail environment, which created a lot more need for people to create and register new brands. So we went from back when I started practicing, you could have a registration in about six months to now on average, I'd say it's taking about 12 to 18 months for that application to get registered. So, yeah, I, I've, uh, I've, I've heard that the application number has gone from pre-COVID, it was 300,000 a year to now they're processing or they're trying to process 4 million a year. And they still have their COVID hiring freeze for on the uh, examining attorneys in Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia. Absolutely. So we uh, have, we, of course, we have the issue of the trademark office is doing the best they can, but they have so many applications coming in. And with so many applications, that also means there's a lot more conflicts that are coming up meaning more office actions, more work that needs to get done, and ultimately more drawn out processes. Once you file that application, it's got to undergo examination, but a trademark officer isn't picking up your application for the trademark office is their goal is eight and a half months right now after filing. I'd say you want to expect it'll be about nine to 12 months, depending on the type of application, what office it gets assigned to before an examiner will go through the application and take a first step. Uh, and if you guys have any questions, use the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to those as we as we keep moving along. So once Let we- Let me ask you real quick. Yeah. I, I think this is a good Segway, I see it on this slide. What exactly is an office action? So an office action is where an examiner is going to identify any barriers they believe exist with the application that might prevent it from being able to register. So it could be everything from something innocuous, like we want to amend the way you describe the logo or the elements in the logo. Instead of saying it's a hat, we want you to say that it's a pointed hat um, to something much more substantive, like a likelihood of confusion with a previously existing application or registration. So likelihood of confusion is the primary grounds that you'll see a rejection come through on if it's going to be something substantive. Those technical and, office actions are often more just a preference of an examiner and typically only take a few minutes uh, to resolve if the examiner can uh, do all the amendments on their end. So I guess let me put it another way. So not all office actions are created equal. Some are really easy and we'll resolve the issue without even telling our clients. Like it, I've seen them so mundane, they're like, hey, can you add a comma to your description? And we're like, yes, we'll just add a comma for our client to, of course, the, the the worst one, which is the likelihood of confusion, which then goes back to, did we do our due diligence? Did we search? Um, because in a worst case scenario, because this happens a lot, someone will already be in their company and using the brand and making money and, and you know having a business, and then we'll get it for likelihood of confusion. And it might be something that they had no idea about, right? And And they're like, they didn't know that in California, there's a company doing the same thing, selling the same thing and using a confusingly similar brand. And what it means is at that point, we can try to fight it, but then we might also worst case scenario, might have to reckon with rebranding, which could be horrible. Absolutely. So say some of the small things that could come through would be like one of our uh, attendees asked a disclaimer. So a disclaimer is something where an examiner says, this portion on your mark is descriptive, meaning it describes directly the goods or the services that you offer. A little bit like we talked about earlier, when we have a descriptive element, 
we have to enter what's called a disclaimer, where we acknowledge we can't stop someone from using this particular term because we can't stop someone from identifying that they have this type of a good or that they are providing this type of a service. Again, like the example of the lawyer. An ex examiner, if I had the lawyer as part of my overall trademark, would likely require that the term lawyer be disclaimed. Why? Because I am a lawyer and that I provide legal services. So I couldn't stop a third party from saying that they are, in fact, a lawyer. Disclaimers don't necessarily prevent you from enforcing the overall trademark, but it does prevent you typically from enforcing that individual element separate and apart from the mark as a whole. So we can't parse out individual pieces of that trademark and say there's a likelihood of confusion because of the overlap of only that portion uh, when there's something that's been disclaimed. Now, once you have a office action issued, you'll have a set response period. Right now, they've limited those response times down to three months, although you can pay an additional extension fee and get yourself up to six months. Ideally, if it's something non-substantive, you take care of those and it moves on to the next process. If it is something like a likelihood of confusion, you'll have a few different options. One of those can be fighting it out with the examiner and trying to show why there is not a likelihood of confusion between the marks, or it could be trying to circumvent the examiner. You might be able to say, look, I know that this business out there doesn't care about me or my mark and that they would be fine with it. So we go to that business and we negotiate what's called a coexistence agreement. A coexistence agreement is where we both agree in writing that we can each use our respective marks and ideally that they would consent to our registration of our respective mark. When we have that, we can present it to the examiner and say, look, we have already worked this out. There's not a conflict here. We've already agreed with the other party. Here's what we're doing. And they've said it's fine. They don't think there's an issue, so you shouldn't either. An examiner doesn't have to agree, but in my experience, I have not come across an examiner who was not persuaded by a coexistence agreement to allow the application to move forward. Once you've overcome any objections, that's when you'll move on to the next step, which is publication. That'll be a 30-day period where all other parties can file what's called an opposition. Essentially, they can choose to oppose your application based on some objection that they have. Say, if they believe they'd be harmed by the registration of your mark, they could go out and argue that they have superior rights to the trademark, maybe because they have an earlier registration that an examiner didn't cite or reject our application for, or because they've been using that same mark just unregistered under common law, uh, and your registration of that mark would hinder their ability to continue to use and maintain that priority. After that period closes and no oppositions have been filed or you've overcome them, and right now it's still pretty rare, I think it's around 2 to 5% of applications actually see an opposition. So if you get to that period, your risk of having something come up is typically pretty low. But of course, if you had problems during the examination or you saw conflicts during your research initially, you might know that something could be coming. After all that's been taken care of, an examiner will get back on your application, do a post-examination review, and assuming everything is in order, you'll get that registration issued. Now, there is one exception to that, and that is where we have an intent to use application. So applications can be filed in a couple of different ways. The intent to use application is where instead of showing that we're already using the mark in commerce, we simply intend to use that mark in commerce in the future. The benefit is we're able to establish our priority date from the filing of the application before we've even launched, but 
The downside is you now have an extra step. So once that application has been approved, you'll have to file what they call a statement of use in order to show that you've begun to use that mark in commerce. And the reason being, trademark uh, statute requires that a mark actually be used in commerce for it to have a registration. So if we're going to get that registration issued, it can't be on a good faith basis that it'll happen sometime in the future, like some countries do allow, but we actually have to have already started using it and to maintain it, we have to keep using that mark. When we're talking about federal trademark registration, which is the most common, there are a number of different benefits. And you'll see a little bit of the difference between the federal and the common law that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. With a federal trademark, we have a presumption of ownership and exclusive use. So typically, and this is primarily for a uh, federal trademark on the principal register, and we'll talk about the difference between principal and supplemental in a moment. The registration gives you the presumption when you go to enforce that mark that not only do you own it, but you have the exclusive right to use that mark in commerce. Federal registrations also give you priority throughout the entire country. So whereas common law rights give you priority in a narrow geographic region around where your business is seated, and state trademarks give you priority within the borders of that state, federal trademark registrations give you priority throughout the entire country, assuming, again, that there are no prior marks that have established priority elsewhere. Say, for example, you register a mark federally, but someone had the mark registered in Wisconsin already. That person in Wisconsin is going to still have priority in Wisconsin, and you could end up in a conflict if your business enters that market. I actually have a good story about that. I had a client in Pennsylvania who had registered successfully Mr. Sandman, and he, you know, guess what he did? He sanded floors. Um, well, believe it or not, there was already a bunch of Mr. Sandmans around the country, but somehow none of them had ever registered their trademark. So what would be your recommendations to someone like him? So he, he has the registration, but a lot of these other people had prior use. So when someone has prior use, but we've gotten the registration, oftentimes what we'll say is that our registration likely cut off their ability to expand the other parties, that is. So the other parties are going to have senior rights in the narrow regions where they were operating. So say we got this federal trademark registered, this guy is in Orlando primarily, and now we see competitors, one's in New Orleans, one's in Atlanta, and so on. Well, the guy in New Orleans probably has superior rights in New Orleans and surrounding areas where they'd operate. Same with the guy in Atlanta. The best case scenario is we be proactive. We don't want to wait for there to be a problem. So in those cases, I'd say go to those parties that have the uh, senior uh, use, negotiate a coexistence agreement, say, look, we got this trademark registered. We understand that you've been using your mark in your area, and we don't want to get into a fight later on, and we don't want you to think that we're going to try to stop you and challenge you, because at the end of the day, we would lose that fight if it was just for their area. But we also want to make sure that they're not going to overlap with the areas that we've now established priority throughout the rest of the country and where we'll likely be trying to expand into. So we negotiate a coexistence agreement. We outline what marks each one of us can use, what types of goods and services we can use those with, and any other terms, say geographic restrictions on where we can use those marks, types of consumers, and even how we might resolve if there's a conflict. Say, for example, if our call center receives an inquiry for work in New Orleans, do we refer that work over to his business and vice versa? Or if they get a query about a job that we did in Mississippi, are they going to let them know, hey, 
that's actually a different company, but let me give you their information and they can assist you with that. We address all those possible consumer confusion issues in, uh, in before they happen so that we don't have a reason to have a fight later on. Now, having this registration, it'll either get registered on the principal or the supplemental register. Principal register gives us those additional presumptions. The supplemental register allows us to get that registration. We can enforce it as well. We just have a couple extra steps to go through in order to successfully enforce the trademark. Constructive notice, having that registration on one of the registers tells other parties out there that you own the rights to this mark. Ideally, the trademark should serve as a deterrent. We're doing all of these things, not because we necessarily want to get into litigation, not because we want to be in a fight with someone, but because by doing so, we hopefully avoid the need for it. By filing one trademark application, you could avoid hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost profits, in litigation costs, for other parties that might pop up with similar names, because now they're going to look and see, oh, wow, this guy already registered that mark and owns the brand. I don't want to get into a fight with him. So let's simply pick a new name. So that leads us into, you've got a basis under statute now for trademark infringement action. If we get into a fight over a federal trademark, that means we get to be in federal court. It's a little bit more of a streamlined process. It's a bit more strict but you also can see cases move through a bit faster sometimes. You get to use that circle R symbol. So that registration symbol that we see here on the right of the screen, that shows to other parties that specifically we have a federal trademark registration. And of course, then that'll direct them if they have concerns to take a look and see what that registration covers and ideally serve as a further deterrent. And then after five years of your registration and your continued use and maintenance of that trademark, you can file to make it incontestable. Doesn't mean it can't be challenged, but it does take away several of those defenses and challenges that people can use against it. Now, we talked a little bit about the two different registers. So, the principal versus supplemental. When you have a descriptive mark, that's often where you're going to get kicked over to the supplemental register. Can't be overly generic or they could still reject it, but in some cases, certain descriptive or weak trademarks can end up on the supplemental register. And the primary reason for that is that the examiner acknowledges look, this mark is descriptive enough that I have doubts there aren't other parties out there that are just using it without a registration, and we don't want there to be a conflict or cre to create chaos in the markets. So that principal registration, it gives you that prima facie evidence of your exclusive right to use the mark. It gives constructive notice to other parties that you have the sole and exclusive right to use that mark. Supplemental registration doesn't have that same effect. So supplemental registration, the idea is it acknowledges there may actually be someone else who has some rights in the mark because of that level of descriptiveness. And since there is someone else that could have rights, we may not have that exclusive ownership or control. And so if we get into litigation with the mark on the supplemental, we need to go through those couple of additional steps to show that we have the rights to enforce this. There isn't another party, or at least the other party on the other side doesn't have superior rights over us. And the supplemental, that can be a stepping stone to the principal? Absolutely. So with the supplemental registration, once you've hit five years, that can serve as the acquired distinctiveness. So essentially we've registered this mark, we've maintained it without conflict or challenge for five years. Now we can go back to the trademark office and say, look, because we've had this for so long, we have acquired distinctiveness with our consumers. They now associate this mark with us and only us. 
And if there was any challenge that was going to be brought, that would have been brought over the last five years. And the examiners will allow you to file an application based on that supplemental registration that can then be registered on the principal register. So we can kind of tag on to that priority and that uninterrupted exclusive time to get those more exclusive and more easily enforced registrations. Now, in terms of state trademarks, so state trademarks will have a few different benefits and it'll really depend on what your business is. So state trademarks give you protection within the borders of a specific state. That can be very helpful if your business is not something that's going to cross state borders. Say you have a laundromat and we're not going to be expanding or franchising. We're not gonna be going, say even outside of the Miami-Dade area we could get a state trademark registration for the name of our laundromat to protect us throughout the state of Florida so we don't have confusion here where we're located. One of the benefits can be cost. Now, the process to file the state application itself may not be, say, faster or cheaper, but the filing fees often are much cheaper. So say in Florida, the filing fee for a state application is about $87.50 per class, whereas federally, you're looking at $250 per class. Likewise, your maintenance filings, your upkeep, all of that is going to be a bit simpler, a bit cheaper, and there's less likely going to be issues that come up along the way. It's a faster process once you file. A state application, at least say in Florida, you can expect you'd have that registration within a matter of weeks, as opposed to waiting one, one and a half years for a federal application. So I always have a famous story about um, the, the, the state by state registration. So there was a restaurant here in Miami called um, Sea Salt and Pepper. Remember that? It was over there on the river. And one day they had to change their name because sure enough, there was a restaurant in Tampa with almost the same name that had done the state trademark registration. They sent them the cease and desist letter and almost overnight they rebranded as uh, Sea Spice. Uh-huh. I mean, when we're talking about these different marks, it is important not only to look at federal, but also the state where your business is going to be popping up in because you're going to have these parties who could have superior rights just in a more narrow setting. Um, oftentimes, we're most concerned with federal registrations and applications because state registrations are less common. But again, it's all depending on the nature and type of your business. So it's very much foreseeable that a restaurant type business, as most are, is going to be local. M most restaurants don't end up franchising or opening up locations throughout the entire country. If you do, that means you're incredibly successful and probably people will know about that business. So uh, actually, I'll add to that. In the franchising process, one of the first steps is making sure you have your trademarks registered um, because that's what you're selling. One of the business in a box is we're selling the brand um, and, and presumably nationwide. Absolutely. So take unique trademarks. Some trademarks are not eligible for registration on a federal level. So say CBD products for edible CBD goods. Federally, if it is a CBD product and it's designed for consumption, that is considered an illegal purpose for the application. Because under federal law, while the Farm Bill did go ahead and legalize uh, CBD products, so long as they have a dry weight basis of 0.03% THC and so on, for topical use, it did not legalize it for consumption. Instead, that still falls under the FDA's purview, and that would require actual FDA approval and registration, and no one really has that. So unless you can show that, that you've somehow gotten FDA approval for this product, you're not going to get a federal registration. However, look around. There are 
an incredible number of businesses and franchises that have come up with CBD and other marijuana type businesses for medical marijuana and, and otherwise. And the way that they protect those brands is either registration for peripheral goods federally, so not the things that, that we're primarily dealing with the business, maybe clothing or, or otherwise, but you can still have troubles federally if they see what else you're doing. But a lot of times it'll be with state registrations and they'll go and they will register in every single state where they are planning to operate the business and sell. And that way they have those priority uh, rights in those states that do have laws that allow registration and use of marks with those types of goods. Um, just real quick, uh, Ben, uh, later on, uh, we have a couple great questions in the Q&A. I think you're going to end up addressing some of them just as you go through the presentation. But um, just for anyone watching, we we promise to answer your questions before the end. Absolutely. We'll we'll get to some of these things we'll, we'll be getting to and the others we'll address once we get towards the end of the trademark section. And, and we've kind of done a little bit more of an overview. So we've got that introduction of what we're dealing with. So common law trademarks, and I see this is one of our questions here, common law trademarks give us rights to that trademark in our specific geographic area. To establish them, that all we have to do is really to use the mark. So you open a business, you open that laundromat, you call it uh, Eric's Laundry, by calling your laundromat Eric's Laundry, you've gotten some limited rights in that name under common law. Common law is a creation of state law. So your rights are going to be specific state by state. You opening that laundromat here in Miami is not going to give you rights in Georgia. And it's probably not even going to give you rights in Orlando or Northern Florida because that's just too far away. So what you're going to end up doing is having rights in the geographic area where you're seated, that reasonable zone of expansion where your business might expand into around your location, and also where your consumers are coming from, where you're going to have that brand recognition and identity. you got to continue to use it. you got to use it exclusively. So we can't stop using the mark and still claim that we have rights in the trademark. Just like a federal trademark where we have to be able to show every so often that we are still using the mark in commerce, common law rights come from use. So if you're not still using it, you won't have those rights. And if you're not the only one using it, meaning you let a number of other businesses pop up around you using the same mark, you don't enforce those rights, you're going to lose the ability to stop them at some point. We have distinctiveness. Your mark has to be unique. It can't just say the laundromat because the laundromat is not distinctive. It's descriptive. We can't stop someone from using a descriptive term. So we want it to have some unique element that is uniquely identifying to you and only you. Geographic scope. We've got to be able to enforce it, but we're only going to be able to enforce it in our limited area. So if someone starts using that mark in, say, Tampa, it probably isn't something we can enforce, and it's also probably not something that's going to cut back on our ability to enforce the mark here in Miami later on. And then evidence. When you start a business, I cannot emphasize enough, create some documentation of your evidence of that mark. Do things that have time and date stamps. So you publish your online retail store, for selling these types of products on January 1st, 2023. That day, go to your, your website, hit print to PDF, include the headers and footers so we can see the date that you pulled that website and the web address. And if you ever have a dispute with someone, now we have documentation to show when we first use that mark in commerce. That kind of evidence is invaluable. And so many people who aren't necessarily filing their trademarks right away, forget this step. And years later, they'll get into a fight with someone and they don't have any documents, they don't have any records. The best they have are some emails back and forth. And those emails probably aren't gonna be significant enough to really establish a strong claim. And without that evidence, 
if we can't establish our priority, then we're going to have this gray area of who has senior rights between ourselves and who may actually be a, a later user. Um, let me let me add a couple points. So first thing is, what is the common law? So the common law, just in general, are the traditional laws that we inherited from England. Um, and under the English legal system, there were certain causes of action that, that arose uh, over time. And one of them was stopping a, a competing business from stealing your likeness, right? That's trademark infringement. And so under the common law, you could sue someone to enforce your rights. And Ben just went through all the steps you would have to prove your case, right? So what's the first difference? Registration, the presumption is already there. And what it does is it switches to the other guy to then he has to disprove your case, right? So here you can say to your blue in the face, well, I swear I started in 1985, but I can't find any evidence, right? And so it's, it's harder on you because there's not just a clear and easy registration where you can just look at the registration and it's got the date right there printed by the government. Um, so that's the first main difference. The second main difference, and I always talk about this, um, is attorney's fees. So if we need to enforce our common law trademark rights, you will not get attorney's fees. So you can sue someone and you can win and you can establish all of these elements that Ben showed, but you will not get your attorney's fees under the common law trademark infringement theory. Um, did I miss anything there, Ben? No, you're you're spot on. And all of these different trademark rights are going to have different pieces that you're going to need to put together in order to enforce, different ways you're going to enforce them, different venues, different requirements. And, you know, as you go, I'd say, down the list from federal to state to common law, it actually gets more difficult to enforce. So how do you establish a claim of trademark infringement? We talked a little bit about it. Trademark infringement, it all comes down to consumers. Is there a likelihood that consumers will be confused? And so when we're looking at that, there's a number of different elements, but one of the things that we always want to start with is how strong is that original trademark? The stronger the mark, the more protections it's going to be given. So everything from it's become a famous mark, it's so well known that consumers are going to associate that mark with this company and only this company. Take uh, hotels.com. Was that a descriptive mark? Absolutely. But it's become so famous that we know who Hotels.com is. The other side is, is it a completely unique mark? Xerox. Not a word. Didn't exist. Didn't mean anything before they created that for their brand. This completely made up term gives them more protections because there's no chance this had been used anywhere else. There isn't any consumer impression or, or meaning associated with it beyond what this company has created out of their branding. What's the intent of the other party? Are they meaning to actually infringe upon the trademark? Is there some sort of uh, malintent? Is, is this uh, fraud or, or, or anything? Are they trying to pull from your pool of consumers? Are they trying to get your consumers to be directed to their business by using this mark? Take, for example, Google Ads. Using a trademark in, say, your paid keywords, in most places, probably not enforceable infringement. But if you use that mark in the text of that sponsored ad that pops up, that very well could be determined infringement, especially if that is being used to direct consumers to your website instead of the competitors. And if those consumers are going to believe there's some affiliation or sponsorship and market penetration, how big have we gotten? Are we a small regional brand or are we on the national scale? In terms of likelihood of confusion, there's a number of major elements that you're going to look at. So we're going to look at how similar are the trademarks themselves? How similar is the name? How similar is the logo? How similar are those slogans? What do they mean? How do consumers, uh, how, how do they 
sound those out? Does it sound similar? Does it look similar? What's the commercial impression it creates? And then how similar are the goods and services? My trademark is probably not going to be enforceable against things that are entirely unrelated. A good test is, are these things purchased together? Are they often sold by the same companies? Are they sold in the same type of stores? Take clothing, for example. What do most clothing brands also sell? They also sell purses under class 18. They probably sell jewelry and other types of accessories that may fall under class 14. A lot of clothing brands also have fragrances, perfumes. All of these things fall under different classes, but they're so heavily related in the marketplace because if you walk into a mall, you're going to expect that all of those goods very well may be located in the same store. So if I'm selling perfumes and you start a clothing brand under the same name, well, consumers are going to think, heck, this is probably the same business. They must have expanded. Then we have things, again, the strength of the mark. The more uh, unique, the more pervasive that mark is, the greater protections we're going to afford it. And so the more uh, limited of a showing you need to have on some of these other elements. Is there actual confusion? Evidence of actual confusion, like consumer complaints or surveys showing that they thought this was one in the same business or that they were related. That is the absolute strongest evidence of a likelihood of confusion because it's not just likely, it's already happening now. So uh, we've seen this happen so many times. I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a guy, and I'm going to change the names a little bit, but he had Boca Computer Repair since 1991, right? He's had it since 1991. He's never registered. So we're in the common law situation. And a guy moves half a mile down the road, and he calls it Boca Raton C Computer Repair. So we've got Boca Computer Repair, and then half a mile down the road, 25 years later, Boca Raton Computer Repair. And he was actually, he had real clients that were like, yeah, we called and we were confused because we were talking to somebody else. We were expecting to get you um, because they called the wrong company. Exactly. And, and when you have those things happen, what does that really mean for you? It means that you're going to have your consumers take their business elsewhere, thinking they're coming to you. It means that Consumers who have a great impression of you are going to wrongly apply that great impression to this other business. But then you have the opposite effect of someone who has a horrible experience with this competitor is going to now believe that that horrible experience was your fault. They're going to leave you negative reviews. They're going to tell their friends and family, don't work with these people because X, Y, and Z happened. And they just don't know the difference between the businesses. And not being able to distinguish them is the whole point of that, that discussion of infringement. You know, consumer carelessness and sophistication. How careful are we when we're buying these types of goods and services? If we're talking about going and finding a very unique type of service, say I'm an inventor and I'm looking for someone who is going to create my new mobile application, I'm looking at spending tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds, on developing a new software. I'm going to be very careful about what kind of person I hire and looking into that person. And I'm also, if I'm spending that kind of money and in that type of industry, probably more sophisticated than just the average Joe. I'm probably more used to doing these types of business transactions and I'm able to better distinguish between these parties that say someone walking into a mall and buying a $10 t-shirt just might not afford that same level to. You're buying something that is literally pocket change for you. You're not going to be that focused on does this label look right? Is this actually the brand I think it is? You see a shirt that you like, it looks okay enough, it's cheap, good enough, we buy it, we go on. Then we have, what is the intent? Is this person trying to infringe upon your trademark? How are they using this mark or this similar mark? 
all of these so, are going to be waiting. Sorry to interrupt. My, my very first trademark infringement case, these guys were in food imports and they quit working for their boss and they set up a directly competing business doing the exact same thing and they just flipped the letters around. So it was veg fru and they became fru veg. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, you know, and this is a, a great question we have here. What about web domains, social media accounts? Are those going to create a likelihood of confusion? The answer is maybe, and it all depends on how it's used. Typically, your web domain is just that address you type in to get to the website. But it could be something like hotels.com, where it also serves as your brand name. And so in that case, that is also their trademark, not just the web address. Your web address on its own typically doesn't hold much weight in terms of infringement. It can in some cases, and there are uh, international dispute resolution platforms like ICANN that allow us to address claims where we believe someone is infringing upon our trademark through the use of a domain. And a lot of it does come down to what the intent behind the acquisition of that domain really is. Because remember, the domain itself could be used for a number of different goods and services, especially if that domain's not being used for any particular purpose. Now, we probably don't have a strong claim of infringement unless this party, say, saw our application, registered the domain immediately afterwards, and is trying to leverage that to force us to pay substantially more than market price for it. But, you know, if, say, we just see someone with a similar domain as ours, but it's not necessarily part of their branding, it's not something they hold out to consumers, it may not serve as use as a trademark for purposes of claiming infringement. Social media accounts are the same, although those arguably are much more prominent of a use because it's not just an address you type in, but it's the actual name of that business account or otherwise that you see that is advertising and promoting those goods and services, say an Instagram account, you have a name on there. Well, that name is repeated on every post you make about your services. It's shown on all the listings of products. And so that probably does create enough of a use to claim infringement of a trademark. Now, what remedies do we have? So when we're talking about a federal registration, we have a handful of different things that we will be able to seek. So one of those biggest ones is an injunction. Injunctive relief means you are trying to stop them from doing something. Oftentimes that means stopping them from continuing to use a mark or continuing to take certain actions that utilize that mark that are causing this confusion or that are causing these problems. Damages, we can go after monetary damages that we believe have, have been incurred. So that could be anything from our lost profits to it could be the harm to our goodwill, the harm to our overall branding and the perception by consumers could be the money that we believe this other party wrongfully gained by using our mark. But then we also have statutory damages. Sometimes it's just too hard to say, what is the value of this injury, the value of these lost profits? How much did we really lose? How much has this really harmed our brand? And that's where statutory damages step in. Statutory damages give a court a lot of leeway to be able to simply set an amount. If we can't establish this was $100,000 worth of harm, the court can say, look, we don't know what the exact amount is, but based on all the facts together, based on how egregious the conduct is, we're going to assess X amount of damages against you. When it's not willful, it's what we call maybe innocent infringement, they're not doing it intentionally, there's a $200,000 cap. When it is willful, when we can establish they intentionally used our mark to play off of our goodwill, that cap goes up to $2 million. It's 
not to say a court's necessarily going to give you $2 million, but that's how much leeway they now have. And that's not just total. That is for each instance of infringement. So say we're talking about goods. If they're putting that mark on t-shirts and they're putting that mark on shoes and they're putting that mark on ties, that very well could be three different instances of infringement. And that could mean our cap is now essentially six million as opposed to two. We have impounding and destruction of the goods. We can essentially take control or have those infringing goods destroyed. Accounting of profits, we can force them to show us how much they actually made off of this infringing activity. And again, going back to those damages, we can pursue those wrongful profits uh, in our recovery, especially if it's too difficult for us to show how much we might have lost. And attorney's fees. In exceptional cases, you might be able to recover your attorney's fees and certain other litigation expenses. So let's talk a little bit about what those exceptional cases are. I know we had a question about that. So exceptional cases, and this is for really all IP claims, attorney's fees are largely only going to be brought when it's something that's really egregious. So typically it's something that is extreme. Someone acted in bad faith for trademark and copyright infringement. That typically means, say, that it was bad faith or there was intentional infringement. So we can show that it's willful. There's a much higher chance that a uh, judge is going to allow us to recover our attorney's fees. Could even be the other way. These uh, attorney's fees can rebound against you. If you file a claim for trademark infringement against someone in bad faith, you know they're not actually infringing, or you know this isn't the right party to file it against, the court can assess the defendant's attorney's fees against you when you lose that case. You can end up having to pay the attorney's fees for the person that you sued. For patent infringement cases, you're looking at typically is the conduct objectively baseless, meaning was, were your activities uh, reasonable? Did you have a reasonable basis for saying that you would not be infringing on this patent? Patents are very complicated. Courts typically give you a little bit more leeway depending on the type of parties, how sophisticated you are. And so say you're a little Joe Schmo and you thought you created this brand new thing and you did it differently. And this big company comes along and says, nope, you're still infringing on our patent. And they can show a number of different ways how they get to that conclusion. The court agrees with them, but they say, look, you're right but it's a lot more strained of an argument and a reasonable person might not have been able to piece that together. They might not assess attorney's fees against you in those cases, but say we're talking about Apple versus Samsung, those guys are much more sophisticated and they should know better. And that's the way the court looks at it, that their conduct is baseless. They, they shouldn't have claimed that they weren't infringing. They should have known that this was problematic from the start. Now, when we're talking about these different claims that you make, we also have some common defenses, and then we'll, we'll answer some questions and, and wrap this up. So the common defenses are going to be largely attacks on the registrations themselves, or they're going to be more these common law claims. So abandonment, fair use, those will typically go after the mark itself. Have we abandoned the mark by stopping using it? That'll apply with a federal registration if we stop for a period of years, or even a state or common law registration if we just stop using it for a certain period of time. Fair use. Do we have a reasonable basis for having used this mark? Let's take, for example, comparative advertising or commentary. We're talking about the difference between maybe our toothpaste and Colgate. In order to identify this product and be able to explain the difference, we might have to use their trademark name to reasonably identify it. But we also can't go over the top. We've got to be limited in how much we use that mark and just as much as, let's say, is reasonably necessary to do so. 
Then we have other common law defenses like latches. Did the trademark owner delay unreasonably in asserting their rights against you? Did they wait five, 10 years before saying that you were infringing their mark after learning that you opened your business? How long can we really expect people to have this apprehension of suit? Unclean hands. Is the other side also to blame for some of this? Did they maybe mislead you or prior use? Had I been using this mark before they got their registration? So all of these things will really lean into some of the defenses that you have. Now, just kind of to briefly touch on some of the other types of intellectual property that you have, we have trade dress, which will fall also under the Lanham Act and be something that uh, will claim akin to trademark infringement um, and will have those same elements to establish, say, a likelihood of confusion, but has a couple more uh, things that we'll need to, to address. So trade dress rights are going to be used when we have something that is, say, non-functional. Oftentimes, it is an element that identifies our brand, but isn't necessarily a logo. It isn't necessarily a name. Take Adidas, for example. Adidas has the three-stripe design. It's not just that one logo they use. They put three stripes on all sorts of products. So they'll register their rights or they'll establish those under common law for, say, three stripes running down the sleeve of a jacket. And those trade dress rights, because they're a little bit more ambiguous, require us to take a couple of extra steps. We have to show that we have distinctiveness. So there's inherent distinctiveness, meaning it is such an inherently distinctive or identifying something that consumers will absolutely associate that with us and only us, or acquired distinctiveness that we've been using this for so long that consumers now associate this with our business and only our business. Red sold shoes, Louboutins, that is not something that they automatically own the rights to right away. They had to work at it. They had to show how much money they've invested in advertising this, how pervasive the knowledge about the red sold bottoms was to be associated with their brand, how consumers would see that and now instantly associate those shoes with them without seeing any other wording or logos. Once they did that, once they could show this, and it's a pretty high showing, they were able to get protections over that one element. There's a number of other odd trademarks that you might get that people just don't think of as being trademarks, say the fuchsia color, that T-Mobile uses, all of these things that are more ambiguous often fall under trade dress, which is really like a subsect of, of trademark rights. Now, let's go through some of these questions that we have here. Um, so for example, we have a product where we are using, using that mark for specific goods now, and we plan to expand into other goods and services in the future. When we're talking about that, what should we file? Well, the answer really comes down to what are we gonna do in our immediate future and how soon do we wanna be able to enforce that mark? So in reality, we can't enforce a trademark registration until it actually registers, until it gets approved. And so in that scope, if we want to file an application claiming a number of different goods or services we're not using yet, we're going to be limited until that mark registers, and that's not going to register until we can show use with everything that we've claimed. So say it's a clothing brand and we want to get into bags later on, if we're not going to have those bags for, say, more than a year and a half, the amount of time we'd expect for that application to get approved, then I'd say hold off on adding that in the application. Let's file it for what we plan to do in the immediate future. And as we get closer to doing bags, you'll file a separate application 
to claim those specific goods with your mark. That way, we're able to get the first application through and approved, get it registered, have something enforceable without it being held up by these other uh, classes of goods. Same for if we have a name, but we don't yet have a logo. So we can file different applications and you typically want to. Your name oftentimes will want to file on its own without any sort of design element incorporated into it. So if we have a trademark application for just the name EPGD business law on its own, no stylization, we have the strongest claim over that name's use, no matter how it might be shown or represented. Your logo, on the other hand, specifically claims what could be limiting elements, those design elements, but it also gives you protection over those design elements. So for example, if someone's using a very similar logo, but the wording might be a little bit different, that registration for your logo could give you a stronger claim versus if someone's using a very similar name with a more different logo, the registration for the name on its own will give you the stronger claim. So these will often be filed separately, but they don't have to be done at the same time. Once those things are done, once you choose the name, file the application for the name. Don't wait. Once you have that logo set, you'll need to file a new application for that logo as they do go separately. Um, I can give a, a perfect example. Um, we originally trademarked just the name EPGD Business Law. And then later on, when we had chosen our logo with the distinctive characters and the color features, um, then we did a second application for the logo. Um, and if I can say it a different way, there's really no benefit or disadvantage to filing them together or separately. They're considered completely separate applications. They could be assigned to two different attorneys, um, examining attorneys. And, um, and the only benefit, if there is one, is maybe your lawyer will give you a deal if you bundle more than one application at the same time. Exactly. So, you know, when we're talking about these applications, every mark, every variation of the mark, is its own trademark and it all has to go in its own separate application. The only real difference is that one mark can claim several classes of goods or services. So let's say we're talking about opening an online brand and we don't necessarily have brick and mortars in place. What do we do? Well, we can claim class 35 for retail services. In some cases, these classifications will have umbrella language that'll encompass what you're doing and more. Take, for example, clothing goods. Under clothing, we have a couple of very broad terms that I love to use. Tops as clothing and bottoms as clothing. Why? Because that covers 90% of your closet. If all we're selling right now is skirts, well, skirts are considered bottoms and those bottoms are covered uh, with that, that description. And that also really protects you against other types of things that might not be literally what you're offering yet. So it might not be that you're offering pants yet, but you could offer pants in the future. Say with the retail services, we may be able to have a broad claim for retail services without specifying whether it's online or whether it's brick and mortar. And so by doing so, we're getting ourselves more broad protections over the mark without necessarily having to establish use with all these other peripheral things that might fall under that umbrella. Now, I think we've got a little bit of time left to go through some of the other areas of IP. Is that right? Let's talk a little bit about we, we discussed what trademarks are. Let's talk about what they're not. And for starters, that would be copyrights. So trademarks are often going to be these simple design elements that comprise your logo. They're going to be these uh, short slogans, these names. Those things typically aren't able to be copywritten. They're not, they don't have what they would call enough artistic elements involved in those works. And so 
when we go to file an application, we have to decide, are we filing a trademark or are we filing a copyright? If it's a very intricate graphic work and it's not necessarily something that we're using to identify our brand or our business, maybe it's something ornamental. Think the design that goes on the front of a t-shirt. That's something that we're going to have as a copyright. So the copyrights protect these artistic works, not necessarily brand identifiers, but these things that have that more artistic involvement. Copyrights will give us additional claims uh, over infringement. So to establish a copyright claim, you need to show we own that copyright, that the other party had access to our work. So say it's something that's not public. Oftentimes that means showing that this employee or past employee had access to the files where this work was kept. Substantial similarity. They don't just have to have had access, but the thing they create really has to be substantially similar to your original work. And then one step further, they actually had to have copied it. So there have to be portions that are copied from the original. It can't just be inspiration alone. And we see a lot of issues of this when we're talking about music. I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with some of the disputes that have happened in pop culture recently with artists releasing songs that have similar melodies or similar lyrics to previous uh, artists' works. Take, for example, uh, Miley Cyrus's new song, Flowers, that came out this year. There were a lot of similarities to a song that I believe it was Bruno Mars had done several years before. But it wasn't that she had copied portions of those lyrics or the works. It was more of a response to some of the claims that were made in that song. Instead of saying that the person can buy someone else flowers, you're saying I can buy my own. And that distinction between the copying really allowed there to not be an issue. No one raised a claim of copyright infringement because we just didn't have that kind of an overlap. When we have copyright infringement, similar to trademarks, we can get injunctions. We can pursue damages for what we've lost. Sometimes that is the lost licensing, lost profits could be other harms that we've experienced. Or when it's difficult to show, there's statutory damages, which for innocent infringement, we'll call it, goes from a minimum really 750 up to 30,000 per work. Or if it's willful, could be as high as $150,000 or more, depending on the situation that we're dealing with. You could have attorney's fees in those exceptional cases we talked about. And copyright infringement is one of those limited areas where there are also criminal penalties for certain types of infringement. Take piracy, for example, not on the open seas, but say of certain types of work that you are copying and redistributing. Common defenses that you're all probably pretty familiar with fair use. Has this been used for news reporting, criticism, commentary? Just because we are showing a clip of a movie on the news to talk about a flub that happened, take, uh, what was it, Game of Thrones, the Starbucks cup that was left in one of the scenes. Many people showed stills of that episode in order to show the the cup and comment on the episode to comment on the production that was not copyright infringement because that fell under this fair use definition or rather if it was copyright infringement it wasn't enforceable for that reason independent creation attacking was there actually this copying did we actually have access to that original work if not we created this independently, whether it's similar or not, and there's not a case for infringement. And then we also have the statute of limitations. Is this outside of that period where they can validly enforce this? Have they waited too long after we published or they learned about our use? And just is the copyright itself invalid? 
was it filed properly? And if not, can they still enforce it? And then the last area of IP is really patents. Patents are those inventions that you create. There's a few different types of patents. The most common are utility patents, where we create a new functional invention. So some process or, or functional uh, object or item or design patents, which are ornamental designs of some article of manufacture, some aesthetic element. Think oftentimes a figurine or take, for example, a coffee cup. We have a new shape or design to this coffee cup that could be a design patent. The last and much less common is a plant patent, new types of, of plant varieties. Now when we're talking about infringement of say a utility patent, we need to show again ownership. We need to show that the product we're dealing with is, is some specific product, some specific process. We have to be able to identify what it is that this other party has that they've created that they're advertising or making that infringes. And then we need to compare the claims in our application to what it is that we're saying infringes upon it. It may sound silly to say, why do we have to identify the product? Isn't that obvious? When we're talking about patents, they're very complicated. And so sometimes what you're claiming infringes isn't say the entire iPhone. It could be one piece of that iPhone. Something that they put in there infringes upon a microchip that your company created. And when we're comparing those elements, we've got to be able to show either one for one that the elements in our claims are located within this uh, article of manufacture or that it is an equivalent. Maybe they swapped out this type of bolt for another type of bolt that provides the same sort of function. Just because it's not identical doesn't mean it's not still functionally equivalent and that we can't enforce our infringement claim. With a design patent, we've got the same first couple of steps, but we have a different way of comparing them because design patents are about a physical form. We're not talking about these stated elements, but substantial similarity. So substantial similarity is where an ordinary observer familiar with the prior art, so familiar with these types of products, would believe that the accused product is the same as your claim design. So take again, for example, a figurine. Is someone who's familiar with these types of products going to think that what this potential infringer is selling is one and the same with what's shown in the drawings of your application? Patents will have similar remedies as well, but instead of statutory damages, we have treble damages. And what that means is that when it's willful, a court can award up to three times the actual damages that were suffered. So instead of just being able to show this harmed me $100,000 worth, the court can say, look, this was willful. So we're going to take those reasonable royalties or we're going to take those lost profits and we're going to triple them. And that's what this party is going to owe you as a penalty for their wrongful conduct. Defenses also very similar. Is the patent even valid? Oftentimes that means you could challenge the patent either in the court where you're seated, say in federal court, or you might challenge it directly at the patent office, depending on how far after registration, where you are in that process, you'll have different options for what those challenges could look like. Prior use, can you show that you actually had released this product before they filed their patent application for their earliest priority date? And then again, similarly latches, did they delay in enforcing this? Estoppel, have they made representations that would make you believe that you would not be infringing? Or are they misusing this patent? Are they trying to improperly engage in behavior that's designed to cut down on competition, not just prevent people from using their invention, but to stop any competitors in the field at all?
And then a lot of this will come down to how these things get enforced. And you'll see the word troll get thrown around a lot. Trolls are what we often call people who will amass certain rights and send out what may be very loosely based claims of infringement. So the trademark ones, they might be sending out claims of infringement for things that are not necessarily identical, but are very loosely based. It could be copyrights where someone has a large database of images that they've gotten and they've hunted down photographers to get the rights to enforce these. And now they have applications that crawl the internet and look for someone who may have unknowingly reposted an image or patents. There are companies that go around and buy up old patent portfolios of businesses that aren't using those inventions solely for the purpose of trying to find someone who might arguably be infringing upon one of those claims. Now it's not to say these are not valid claims that you guys have, but it is something that you might not be expecting to have against you. And that's because these, these types of parties go out there and they find absolutely everyone and make very, we'll call it uh, loose claims against the, the parties that they find. And so sometimes your best option is to settle quickly and resolve something as cheap and efficiently as possible. And sometimes if it's a, a more strained claim to challenge it. So let's go through and take a look at some of the other questions that we have here before we wrap up. Um, so let's see, the elements of a trademark application. So the trademark application is largely going to follow what we talked about earlier, depending on whether it's state, whether it is federal, uh, you're going to have information about who the owner of the mark is, what the mark that you're registering is. Is it a name? What's the name? Is it a logo? What's the logo? What are the elements of that logo? You're going to have information about what the goods and services that you're claiming that mark is going to be used in connection with. If you're already using that mark, you would provide evidence of that use in the initial application, documentation, dates of when you began using it. Then you'll get into some other items like, are you represented by an attorney? Who's that point of contact for the examiner to reach out to? And of course, you'll get into details for, say, the actual filing itself. You'll have a payment that needs to be submitted at the time of filing. And then ideally, you should get that application filing number pretty quickly after submission. Let's see. Can you, do you need to have an LLC established before you file an application? No, not at all. If you don't have your company established, it obviously doesn't exist and it can't own an application yet, but you can file that application and you can assign those rights at a later date. So for example, I'm going to start this business. I just haven't formed it yet, or the state hasn't processed my documents to form it because that entity doesn't necessarily exist yet. You would probably file that application under your own personal name. And then once you've set up that company, we would prepare and execute an assignment agreement that gets recorded with the trademark office to transfer ownership from one party to the next. And as for how do replica companies sell on sites? So sometimes these companies are infringing upon the trademarks, upon the patents, upon the copyrights of others. It's really a case-by-case -case basis to be able to say what they're doing and why those businesses still operate. Generally, retail platforms don't themselves have liability for the things, the products that their users post. Amazon is not liable to you because a third party posted a listing for a infringing phone. Uh, or an infringing clothing design. Now, Amazon might have some responsibilities if you report this, like a DMCA notice for copyright infringement, and they don't take action. But barring that, 
your claim, if anything, would be against the party who actually created this. Um, I have a question for you, Ben. So I was at, I was visiting an office earlier today and they had a quite amazing art collection. And he was showing me a mix, a mixture of original real paintings, lithographs that were authorized by the artist, right? So they're copies, but like authorized by the artist. He had um, a bunch of Warhols, right? That were the authentic lithograph, just not signed by Andy Warhol. And then he had um, a wall where he admitted to me that he paid a local artist to just make a copy of some well-known art by somebody else, right? So he's paying a local artist for himself, for his own private collection, right? He's not selling it. Um, where does that fall? I, I know this is copyright. Um, how would that be handled? Right. So that would be an issue of copyright infringement. Now, with copyright infringement, there doesn't have to be this public dissemination of this work. It, it's not something like, say, defamation, where we have to have this be conveyed to third parties. The creation of this copied work could still be copyright infringement, and it could be actionable. It would just be on a smaller scale. So for example, a court is going to look at what would be a reasonable uh, license, for example, for someone to create a replica of this. And that could be as simple as looking at, does this artist sell prints of their work? If they sell prints of that work, how much are those prints? How much would a print of this, this size, this scale be? How much did that artist lose by you having someone create this instead of going to that artist for a copy, copy or, or a print of that? And so the risk with copyright infringement isn't always the size of the damages, but it could be you did this and you went to this other party because you knew that artist was going to charge you more. And so you may have done it willfully. And so if they file suit, maybe they'll get $2,000 for a reasonable royalty or, or a reasonable cost for, for having created that. But then they might also get their attorney's fees. And you can bet dollars to donuts their attorney's fees are going to be a lot higher than that couple thousand dollars it might have cost to get an original print, one that was licensed and authorized. Interesting. And they would have to have registered the copyright, right, before they could file a lawsuit or, or make a demand? So copyrights are, are a funny something in that merely by creating the work, you own the copyrights in it. You don't have to register it to own the copyright but you do need to register it to enforce it. So if you want to file suit for copyright infringement, you have to have registered that work. And whether or not you're able to claim certain types of damages, say statutory damages, depends on when you registered that work, both in when in connection with when we created it and when we first published it, to when we learned about this infringing article. If we do it after the fact and we wait too long, we might forego our ability to claim those statutory damages where really a lot of the money is because of how hard it is to show some of the, the losses you could incur from infringement. All right, well, as you can tell, this is a passionate subject for Ben. Uh, this isn't the only thing he does around here, but it might be the thing he does the best. <laughs> so I want to thank everyone for joining us. We're going to have a recording available. Um, we'll probably replay it at a future like fake webinar. And then we will uh, put it on online on our website. I want to thank everyone. This has been great. And if you have any questions, Ben doesn't charge consultation fees. Just shoot him an email and um, he can hopefully help you out. All right. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure to, to speak with you. I appreciate the very thoughtful questions and hope we've answered everything as best we can. But exactly, if there's anything that you guys need, say you get a wild hair and you're just not sure how something works and you want to know what that might mean for your business, shoot us an email, give us a call. And worst thing that we can do is to say, look, you don't have to worry about it or this is a problem or this is what you need to do. And you know what those next steps look like. Knowledge is always a better thing to have. I like that.
All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.